I had just left East Texas State University uh, based on social issues and moral issues down there in the state of Texas. I had gone back to New York. I had a young wife and a young baby. Uh, and I was contemplating, what am I going to do? This particular day, I was at my mom's house, and I was helping my mom to paint the kitchen. And the phone rang. And it was Professor Harry Edwards on the phone. And he stated to me that he was in New York to have a meeting. Uh, and the people that was hosting the meeting requested that he invite me to the meeting. I very seldom went downtown to any of the hotels. And I went to the desk and asked them for an organization called SCLC. I had no clue as to what SCLC was. I realized once I got inside that there were a lot of luminaries in that, in that room, uh, people that we had watched on TV that was involved in the civil rights movement. I'm there for about 20 minutes or so. And then the door opens in another room and out walks Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I was fit to be tired, man. My lip, my lip dropped dead off into my lap. And the emphasis of the meeting was to establish his relationship or his marriage with the potential Olympic boycott. Uh, he wanted to make it very clear that he supported the Olympic boycott. When he asked, did I have any questions? Yes, I had two questions. And the first question was, uh, Dr. King, had you ever played any sports? And he smiled, he laughed. He says, a good question. He said, but I can't shoot pool. Uh, and then I asked him, I said, well, why would you get involved in the Olympic movement? And he told me, he said, John, just imagine you getting in a big rowboat and you're in the midst of a large lake and you row out to the center of the lake and you pull the oars in and sit there and you pick up a rock he said, that rock was the Olympic boycott. He said, when it hit the water, anything and everything in that lake knew something was amiss. He said, anything on the shores of that lake knew something was amiss. And the second question to him was, Dr. King, if they threaten your life, why would you go back to Memphis? And he, he told me, he said, John, that's a better question. He said, John, I have to go back and stand for those that won't stand for themselves. And John, I had to go back and stand for those that can't stand for themselves. Well, my life came full circle just by that statement because that's what I've been doing all my life with people, but I never had a title or a phrase to put over it. I had horn rim glasses on at that time. That was the glasses of the style at the time. And I remember pulling my glasses down on my nose as I'm doing now, putting my glasses on my nose because I wanted my eyeballs to see his eyeballs with nothing between the two. And quite naturally, anyone can pretty much figure out what I'm looking for. I'm looking at a man who just told me that they threatened his life, so therefore I'm looking for fear, shaking, serious concern about his well-being. And when I looked in his eyes, I didn't see any fear or any shaking. I saw the rock of Gibraltar. I saw nothing but love and compassion in, in his eyes for humanity. And it gave me the impression that it was beyond his life. He wasn't concerned about his life as much as he was concerned about doing the right thing. I think he conveyed that in his speech that he gave the night before he uh, lost his life. So it all came full circle and you have to ask yourself, uh, what's most important? Stand with your convictions and have no fear? because what you stand for is far greater than flesh and blood anyway. It's the spirit that you prevailing on society that will live long after your flesh and blood is gone from this planet.